In 1965, professors Martin Skein and Edgar Hale conducted one of the strangest sexual experiments of all time at the University of Pennsylvania. After noticing the high libidos and sex drives of turkeys, they posed a theory that they could trick one of the birds into having sex with a model one. After a lot of success on multiple turkeys, the scientists then proceeded to evaluate the minimal stimulus necessary to incite a turkey to get it on with a fake bird. They began removing certain elements from the model, starting with its tail, then its feet, then its wings. But the male turkeys continued to have sex with the models despite their odd appearances. After stripping away more and more, Skyn and Hale were shocked to find the turkey would even try to copulate with the model if it were nothing but the severed head of another turkey on a stick. While Skyn and Hale never made the leap into human trials, other sex scientists have speculated that the experiment also may affect human men in regards to sex dolls. 1965 proved to be a kinky year for animal sex, as just months later a scientist named John C. Lilly underwent experimentations on dolphins. Though he wasn't seeking anything sexual in nature, Lilly wanted to determine if he could teach dolphins to communicate and understand the English language. He set up a living situation between a dolphin and his 23-year-old assistant Margaret that allowed the two of them to live in a house with 22 inches of seawater. Margaret could wade through it at all times and the dolphin named Peter could swim in it. They spent every day with each each other for 10 weeks. Margaret attempted to teach Peter human words and sounds, and Peter became receptive. However, he also started pestering Margaret for sex, constantly bumping into her and using his human communication skills to goad her into his desires. Late in the experiment, he flashed his erect penis at Margaret, and to everyone's surprise, received his reward, as Margaret agreed to have sex with him. The experiment was deemed enough of a success for John Lilly to keep experimenting to find the extent of a dolphin's capacity to understand English. But he soon ran out of funding and resorted to giving the dolphins LSD. One of the breakthrough experiments regarding the differences between men and women was also one of the simplest. While working at Florida State University in 1978, psychologist Russell Clark wished to test the hypothesis that men were more prone to have sex with strangers than women. He instructed a group of his students, half male and half female, to go around campus one night and walk up to a person and recite the exact same line. I have been noticing you around campus. I find you to be attractive. Would you go to bed with me tonight? The results were unsurprising. It was reported that 75% of males responded to the women positively, wishing to engage in the sexual activity that was presumably promised. However, not one woman gave a positive or engaging response to the men that approached them. While the experiment worked in illuminating the large gap of sexual attitudes in men and women, it did not account for many factors, including the pressure of conservative social behaviors, complex sexualities, and the general attractiveness and demeanor of those involved in asking the question. The classic story of Tarzan posed a scientifically bizarre hypothesis. What if a man grew up in a family of apes? In 1931, psychologist Winthrop Kellogg set out to prove what would happen in the reverse. He purchased a chimpanzee named Gua and adopted it as his own child. Gua soon became friends and living partners with Kellogg's 10-month-old son, Donald, and the two seemed to share an inseparable bond. For months, Kellogg and his wife attempted to teach their children the English language and basic communication, but they could not get Gua to become receptive. To their horror, they also learned that Donald himself was not learning from his parents, but was instead taking cues from Gua. One day while waiting for his food, Donald began to imitate Gua's barking howls in order to get attention from his mother. It was at that moment Kellogg realized his experiment had gone too far. Fearing the further development problems for his son, he shipped Gua to a primate center, where she died a year later after contracting a fever. It was not reported if Donald had any recurring developmental problems later in life. Stubbins Firth may have the credit of being one of the dumbest yet luckiest experimenters to have ever lived. As he trained to become a doctor in Philadelphia in the early 19th century, he posited a theory that the then rampant yellow fever that was attacking the population at the time was not contagious because it did not appear in the winter months. To prove this, Firth began cutting himself and inserting the vomit of a yellow fever inflicted patient onto his open wounds. He repeatedly bathed in the vomit, drank the vomit, and continuously injected the vomit directly into his bloodstream, yet never succumbed to the disease. While he proved his experiments to be a success, it was later revealed that the yellow fever is in fact very contagious, but only when it encounters the bloodstream of a patient. Many scientists were baffled at Firth's findings, but some went on to say that the sheer constant exposure to yellow fever provided the man with an immunity to the disease, which, while it may have saved his life, proved his experiment was greatly unnecessary in the first place. 
Acting off a previous experiment done in 1954 that proved the septal region is the major conductor of feel-good sensation in the brain, Tulane University's Robert Heath conducted a new experiment in 1970 that sought to prove one thing – he could change the sexual behaviors of a homosexual man. He received permission from a homosexual subject he calls B-19 to attach a machine that would be wired to B-19's septal region and cause immense sexual pleasure and euphoria. The subject could press a lever to activate the machine as much as he wanted. B-19 clearly enjoying the experiment and the sexual effects of having his septal region probed, pressed the button 1500 times in the span of three hours, becoming radically addicted to the sexual sensations. His libido had increased by nearly 15 times. Then to enact the final part of the experiment, Heath brought a female prostitute into the room and gauged the results. For an hour, B-19 did not press any inclination to have sex with the woman, but after she instigated an encounter, he quickly agreed to have sex with her. Heath deemed his experiment a success, but he was curious to learn of the after effects in B-19's life. Apparently, B-19 returned to homosexual encounters, but reportedly began having an affair with a married woman just a few months later. Satisfied with his results, Heath never attempted the experiment ever again. In 1962, researchers at the City Zoo of Oklahoma City presented the world with the long evasive question, what would happen if you gave an elephant tons of LSD? With not much to go off of, the director of the zoo filled a syringe with 297 milligrams of LSD and fired it into the back of an elephant named Tusco. It should be noted that 297 milligrams is nearly 3,000 times the level a human being could sustain, and it is also the highest dose of LSD ever given to a living creature. Tusco reacted to the drug quite violently, running around, thrashing, and eventually passing out. An hour later, the researchers attempted to revive him, but failed, leaving Tusco dead. Years of controversy followed the experiment, until a man named Ronald Siegel wished to prove that it was not the amount of LSD that killed Tusco, but likely the drugs used in the attempts to revive him. In the new experiment, Siegel gave two elephants the same amount of LSD, but put it into their water bowls, rather than shooting them with syringes. The elephants reacted rather mildly, with only a few drunken calls and strange walking patterns to illuminate anything had been given to them at all. Despite this, controversy still looms over both experiments.